Welcome on this December 13th, 1995. My name is Bob Wilson and I'm professor of church history at Acadia Divinity College. And it's our privilege today to interview the Reverend Dr. Howard Taylor. Dr. Taylor has been pastor, missionary, family counselor, and longtime lecturer in the clinical department of Acadia Divinity College, and just this year has come to retirement. Welcome, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. It's good to have you with us today. It's a pleasure to be here, sir. And I wondered as we talk today if you would begin at the beginning of your life for us, uh, where you were born, to whom you were born, and a bit about your family. I was born on the 13th of May in 1928, and that was the, on Mother's Day in the year that women uh, won their privilege to vote. So I've been sort of pro-feminist uh, uh, since the very beginning, I believe. <laughs> My father was Carl Ernst Taylor. He was a manufacturer's broker in the city of Halifax for the Atlantic provinces. And my mother uh, was a teacher at the Halifax Business uh, College. Uh, I enjoyed my early years of life with uh, my parents. And my grandparents had a, a good influence on my life in the early years, too. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I have one brother, Robert, who's also an ordained minister. He's two years younger than I am. He's presently serving a church just outside of Fredericton in Kingsclear, New Brunswick. Tell us a little bit about your family and, and its relationship to the local church as you were growing up. My father was very active <coughs> in West End Baptist Church. He directed the orchestra that they had in those days uh, in West End Baptist, and he served on a number of the uh, committees in the church and for a good number of years was deacon in that church. And your mother, did she have some involvement as well? My mother for a fair number of years was a member of the United Church and later came and joined with my father at West End Baptist Church. I guess my brother and I both ended up in ministry because they said we got preached at so much that we couldn't be much else but preachers. <laughs> <laughs> what about your own early involvement in the church in West End? I was in the Sunday school through the early years of my life and took an active part in the young peoples uh, of West End and uh, I was licensed to preach at a very young age in, in 1947 um, and that I think came out of the times that I spent in young people's and the, br uh, the men's brotherhood of the church and used to go out and church surveys for the establishment of some of the satellite uh, churches that uh, formed from West End. Um, and I always had a, a keen interest in the missionaries that came to visit. I don't know if that had anything later with my becoming a missionary, but uh, I remember when Dr. Barris came to West End, I was about six or seven years of age and he made quite a, an impression on me at that time. Now at what point do you begin being involved in sort of pastoral leadership in church ministries? That came uh, when I was a manufacturer's agent on the weekends with my uncle. He was a deacon in the Amherst Baptist Church and we used to hold services, he and I together in some of the churches that had no pastor at the time. and. Uh, then in the summer of 1948, I pastored uh, a church field out back of Annapolis, the Hillsborough Parkers Cove Litchfield, um, for the summer months. I did the work on a bicycle. I was green behind the ears, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> now. You mentioned just briefly that you were a manufacturer's agent. What did you do then after high school? And After high school, um, I took a, a business course, and then I represented a number of manufacturing companies from Ontario and Quebec for the Atlantic provinces. Now, what were they companies selling? What kind of products? All these, everything from uh, woolen blankets and... Uh, uh, men's uh, work clothes, um, uh, ladies' full-fashioned hosiery, lingerie. I had about 10 or 12 different uh, lines uh, and sold to the wholesale and retail trade. 
we haven't mentioned your education in up to this point. Why don't you tell us about your high school education, where you went to high school, and then on, because you changed professions in 1950 and went back to school. I uh, graduated from Queen Elizabeth High School and uh, for a short time attended Dalhousie University with the thought of going into medicine, but when I I have always had trouble with my eyesight and in microscopic work the things that were there to be seen I half the time didn't see and uh, I then uh, took a year of psychiatric nursing and enjoyed that very much but because I think of the time I had spent in lay ministries um, I had a strong interest in the church and in 1951 uh, I married my wife Marilyn Mar who was Marilyn Marshall and uh, that summer we accepted a call for uh, a summer pastorate in Myra in Cape Breton and enjoyed that immensely later had some of the young people that were there as students uh, in in their theological training maybe we should ask a question or two about Marilyn since you have been together so many years where did you meet her and how did your relationship develop I've known Marilyn since she was five years old when we were in Sunday school together in West End Baptist Church. Uh, we were in Young People's and served on the various committees in the Young People's Group. <coughs> and in fact, we were part of the team that surveyed the north end of the city for the establishment of Mulgrave uh, Baptist Church. But we were, at that time, we were just friends. And, uh, uh, in 1951, uh, after a period of, of being in Young People's and Badminton and a few other things, uh, we became engaged and two weeks later I asked her to marry me and we took off for Myra Cape Breton for the summer. <laughs> From 1951 on you then went back to university. Tell it, us about those days. In 1951, um, after that pastorate in Cape Breton, I came to Acadia University. And I came because the year before, uh, I had several friends who were in Young People's with me, um, George Hillis and Terry Tingley and uh, uh, a number of others who, when I visited them at the university, said, why don't you come and join us? So the following year I did in, uh, in September of that year, I entered Acadia for my arts and was accepted as a student pastor in Gasparo, right the other side of Wolfville, and was there for four, three, almost four years as a student. Right. Now, you did the normal um, BA program or a BTH. What program were you in when you came? Uh, when I came, I started with <coughs> the BTH program and uh, switched to the uh, BA program so that I could go on and do my uh, Bachelor of Divinity, which later became the Master of Divinity degree. Now, did you stay on at Acadia to do that? Yes, I did, and, and uh, I moved from Gaspro to accept a call to the Falmouth Church and was at the Falmouth Church during my studies for my uh, Master of Divinity. Would you tell us about the School of Theology in those days? You were studying here and uh, what the flavor was like and some of your faculty members? I enjoyed those years. Uh, the School of Theology at that time was in Sawyer's Hall and had a tremendous faculty. Uh, Dr. McGregor Fraser, uh, who always said to me I had a philosophical mind. I didn't quite at the time know what philosophy was to know that I had a philosophical mind. Uh, Dr. Lumsden, uh, who taught Greek, and although Greek was difficult, I enjoyed Greek uh, very much. Uh, Dr. Whidden, who uh, I learned church, uh, a great deal about church history, but I remember Dr. Whidden for his ability to pray. Um, he was a man that always gave thought to what he said in prayers, and they were always meaningful. That made it quite a, quite a mark upon me, I think, as much as I, the knowledge I gained from church, church history. Uh, and Dr. Merrick, uh, I think Dr. Merrick was the reason that my wife and I decided to go as missionaries. 
Um, I became quite interested in Bolivia because he had served there for a number of years. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, as I was interested in Bolivia, my wife was reading about the work, uh, new work in Africa. I'd give her work, I'd give her the t material to read on Bolivia, she'd give me material to read on Africa, and we ended up in Africa. <laughs> Can we go back just a step? There are two other questions I want to follow up on. One is your call to ministry in the first place, because you know you had been doing some preaching. At what point in your life did you sense God is calling me into this ministry? And we, we haven't really explored your own conversion experience when you were baptized, so let's go way back there and talk about that spiritual pilgrimage. I think my spiritual pilgrimage in part was due to the early training from my parents and particularly my paternal grandmother and uh, I think I felt the call to ministry out of those times of lay ministry um, in the men's brotherhood <coughs> and more particularly in the work that I did with my uncle when I was in business at that time I was making good money in commissions but I've always been interested in people and I think it was the involvement with him that really began to sow the seeds that perhaps ministry was where I ought to be. If you just keep going with it, the call to the mission field for you in Maryland. I think that as I mentioned before, with the influence of Dr. Merrick upon my life and the work, the tremendous work that he had done in Bolivia and Peru made a mark on me. He had some tremendous black and white photographs of the, works, of the work that he had been involved in there. And the material that my wife was giving me on Africa um, made an impact as well. And we knew some of the folk that had already been accepted as candidates for the mission field in Africa. Before we move on to the, your time in Africa, one other question I'd like to ask about student life at Acadia at the time that you were studying here in the School of Theology, because the number of you went on to do some very interesting things. Uh, tell us a little bit about s your relationship to some of the other students in those days. I think that some of the interest I had um, perhaps even before I knew that I'd ever go to Acadia, was that in West End Baptist Church, we had uh, a fair number of persons who had been in service during the war who came back to study ministry. And they were some pretty capable persons who had some very, very interesting experiences during the war, like Hinson McLeod, uh, who was in the uh, Air Force, um, uh, Donald Jackson, who was in the Air Force, um, Arthur Hurdle, um, that made a mark upon me when they came to speak as students in their study. Sam Holmes, who later became pastor in the church, the Baptist Church in Ottawa, where Diefenbaker and his wife attended. Uh, so there was a maturity. I think one of the reasons I think that uh, students should have a crack at the business world or something before they get into ministry. They were mature persons that knew what they were after and where they were going as they were pursuing their studies for ministry. Uh, I think they had an identity of who they were and took the training to fulfill their call to ministry. And that made a mark upon me. In the years when you yourself were a student, there were a number of activities that students took part in. Uh, what kind of spirit was there among the students at that point in time? Well, it was a small building and we were crawling over one another, as you would imagine, for the number of students that were there at that time. Um, a number of, as I said before, were in young people's together, so uh, we had had uh, uh, an understanding of each other from earlier years. And there was a fair amount of, uh, uh, well, hockey, uh, basketball, and debating and of course I learned to talk at an early age so I enjoyed <laughs> debating and we won the uh, interclass debating uh, for uh, that year and then went on to uh, London Ontario for intervarsity 
uh, debating, so I enjoyed that. There were a lot of things that uh, to participate, but I had full-time uh, student responsibilities. Uh, I had five or six courses each year and, and uh, three churches. I think there was, during my time in Gaspero, there was only one night that I had free for study. The rest were tied up in young people's and boys' groups and prayer meetings. And then there were always funerals and weddings. And busy time. Now, for you and Marilyn, as you were accepted for missions, 1957, what yes. kind of change did that bring in your lives? And, and where did you do language study? And tell us about going to the mission field. I think it brought a lot of changes in our life. We, we'll be married in for 45 years this summer, and in 45 years of married life, we've moved 35 times. And when you think <laughs> that we've lived for 28 years in one place and four or five years in several others, it brought a lot of moving. <laughs> and uh, we enjoyed it all. Uh, yeah, I think it was heavy for my wife because she had the responsibility of, of children. Somebody said every time we made a move, we had a child. It wasn't quite that bad, but uh, there were, were five children uh, through all the various uh, stages of my pilgrimage. So it, it made it quite heavy for her, but uh, again, very enjoyable. Where did you do language study? We went from uh, 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 Canada to Lisbon, Portugal, and we were to be there for six months, but it took us a year and a half to get our visa. So we did some missionary work in Lisbon, Portugal, while we were learning the language. And then you went to Angola. Then we went to Angola, Portuguese, West Africa, and that was a trip in itself, 26 days in the sea with, at that time, two children that no railings on the side of the, of the freighter. Was, that was a kind of a hair-raising experience. Uh, where did you then go and begin ministering in Angola? Tell us about those Angola years. We had the responsibility of directing the mission station at Kimponda, which is the very mouth of the uh, uh, Congo River. And it was a fairly large mission station. At that time, the school system in, in Angola was in the hands of the various mission stations. And we had something in the vicinity of 35 churches and as many schools to be responsible for overseeing the pastors and the teachers in those schools and churches. What kind of housing did you have in those days? We had very good housing. In fact, uh, we were privileged to uh, enter one of the newly constructed homes. Um, so we were comf we were very comfortable on the mission station. Um, the The most difficult part of that was the climate, the tremendous humidity. It, that took some getting used to, and keeping our eyes upon our children. I remember the the second day we were there. I saw my youngest son at that time, who would be about about four years of age, on his hands and knees and trying to catch something. And when I looked down, he was trying to get a hold of the tail of a cobra, which if it had bitten him, he would have been in bad shape. So you had to be careful for those kind of uh, scorpions, and that was the main thing. And illness, that we all had malaria and jungle fever and things like that, but good medication and good medical care. Now, you weren't there very long before the revolution took place in Angola. Um, no, that's a story almost in itself, uh, and a sad story, because that broke up a, a lot of well-established churches and schools and cost a lot of Africans and their families their lives. Now, were you folks involved in any of the fighting, or did you see it coming and get out? We were on the coast, and the greater part of where the danger was more to the north of where we were. And by the time it got to where we were, uh, we had sent our families home. I was alone on the mission station. I could have gone into the Portuguese village, but I chose to stay, I guess, in part to identify with the Africans. And I think in the fact that 
I did that, gave some protection from the Africans that were there from the military, because there were other places where there were no missionaries, that the military really did some pretty destructive things to the African people. Now, when did you finally leave? I left Africa <coughs> in the spring of 1961, and uh, my family had preceded me by several months. Now, did you fly or sail, or how did you... you no, I flew home. In fact, in, on the way home, I was in the midst of that upset in, in Brazzaville in the Congo, and persons were wanting me to carry letters so to the country, and uh, that was another interesting story <laughs> in itself. Yeah. The French paratroopers were there to maintain order, and uh, it's interesting at times to be in, in part of hi when history is taking place with political upheaval. Yeah. Trying, but interesting. Yeah. When you came back to Canada, what then did you and Marilyn do in terms of, of placement, and what did you decide to do with your lives? Well, I had been interested in, in clinical pastoral education before I decided for missions. In fact, I had been halfway through a thesis on the Greek words for love. And when I decided for missions, I was asked to change my thesis, and I did. Uh, I did a thesis on Christianity and conjuring primitive religions. So I picked up what I had left off from, and Dr. Charles Taylor was uh, doing uh, clinical training programs at the time. And I took a summer school in clinical, and through the uh, interest of uh, Dr. Abner Langley and Dr. Cherry, who had just come up from Southern Baptist, um, they helped me make arrangements to go and study at Southern Baptist uh, Seminary in Louisville, which I did and enjoyed very much my year there. You were there for one year. What yeah. were you studying when you were at Southern? I was studying uh, for my master's, but at that time, the the seminary had lost its degree granting ability because of the, uh, I guess, unscrupulous behavior of some of their uh, graduate students. Uh, interestingly enough, some of the ones who were most guilty were doing their studies in Christian ethics, taking books out of the library that were not to be taken, and a few other such things, which was not a very nice time uh, for the school, and they lost their accreditation for granting degrees at that time, but I had a wonderful year in spite of that. I was privileged to take a number of courses from Dr. Wayne Oates in marriage counseling and, and family therapy, which has stood me in good stead. Okay. Now, you then returned to Atlantic Canada. What did you do in, at that point? When we returned from the States, um, I was asked to be pastor in the Canning uh, United Baptist Church in Canning, and we were there from 1962 to 1965, at which time I was accepted for postgraduate study at Indiana University Medical Center in Indiana, in Annapolis, in Indiana. Now, when you went to Indiana, you were studying then more in family counseling. What was the thrust then? I was accepted <laughs> on a rather unique program uh, for clinical pastoral education to train to be a, a, a teaching supervisor. And at that time, Indiana University Medical Center was the second largest. It later became the largest medical center in the States. Um, they had a staff of 700 doctors and four or five uh, different hospitals affiliated and we were privileged to take the classes with the third and fourth year medical students and um, make the rounds in the medical and surgical wards with them so it gave us a great opportunity to relate our pastoral ministry with the various uh, medical and surgical needs of the patients to whom we were ministering. Now, did you have an employment for those years when you were there? Yes, I was a student pastor in Advance in a, in a, a Methodist church in Advance, uh, Indiana, which would be about 30, 30 miles outside of Indianapolis. And in my second year, I was fortunate to have a scholarship for um, a research project with the uh, National Institute of Mental Health and the Eli Lilly Foundation 
in going to the various uh, city centers in the state of Indiana to establish what the, the current social problems were and to uh, build uh, programs for the clergy on an ecumenical base to address those problems. And during that year, I also served as chaplain of the Coleman uh, Gynecology and Obstetric Hospital. During those years when you were in the United States, um, how would you compare living in Canada as over against the United States and your experience at that period in time? At the time we <coughs> were in Louisville and, and the two years we spent in Indianapolis, um, there were sections of both cities that there were, were serious uh, um, problems. But in the main, uh, life at that time was not anything like what it is in those areas today. It, there were sections of the cities that were, I suppose, dangerous in that sense, but not in any degree like uh, today. In fact, I would, I would think that what we're facing here in Canada today, which we don't enjoy, is, is more on the level of what uh, we experienced in the time we were in Louisville and Indianapolis. Before we leave that period of your life, I'm wondering what kind of housing arrangements you had in those days for you in Maryland and your children? When we were in Louisville, we were fortunate to be in what was known as Seminary Village, which was taken over by the seminary from the military. There were 26, uh, 20, 26 buildings that each had several apartments, and we were very comfortably housed in in Louisville, in, in Seminary Village, which is very close to uh, the seminary and to the Louisville General Hospital where I took some training also in, in clinical training. When we were in Indianapolis, we had the good fortune to have a lady who had the responsibility of renting her parents' home. And at that time, we had three, four, we had four children. And to have a new home open to us fully furnished with four children was almost a miracle and we added a fifth child because Nancy our daughter was born in Indianapolis. Well, Dr. Taylor time has flown very quickly and we've come to the end of this section of the interview process so we'd like to thank you very much for being with us and we look forward to the continuing of the interviews. I've enjoyed it thank you.